This is uh, the eighth in a series of videotaped talks about adventures in foreign policy that I was involved in during the last 50 years. Uh, but this one is about the single most important treaty that was passed during the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. And what you're going to see at the end, the moral of all this is, that this treaty was approved really by a miracle, by a narrow thread. And I'm going to uh, summarize what I said in the first two talks about this treaty uh, so that you'll see the full uh, picture. Now, as you know, uh, the United States and the Soviet Union built intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads that could reach each other's country. And they had enough missiles on each side to destroy all the major cities of the other country many times over. If all these missiles had been fired, the United States would disappear and never be able to be repaired. So much would have been destroyed. So I spent 40 years, 50 years, still working on it actually, trying to make sure all these missiles didn't go off. And at the very beginning of my uh, work in this field in 1962, I learned that uh, both sides had been considering uh, building anti-ballistic missiles. So these were missiles uh, that could uh, uh, be launched to destroy incoming missiles. And they came to have nuclear warheads on them too. And their nuclear warhead would be set off and it would destroy the missile that had been fired. So this is a diagram of the difficulties of hitting a bullet with a bullet. There'd be this incoming, um, uh, there'd be this incoming uh, uh, warhead, an enemy missile on the left with decoys and a warhead, and you'd have to figure out which were the decoys, which was the real warhead, and then your uh, anti-ballistic missile would have to hit it. It was a very difficult task, but both sides were working on it. I realized that this was not going to work. And I realized that uh, a lot of money could be wasted trying to make it work. And at the time I began working at the Hudson Institute, in my uh, first job in this field, it had, was known in the newspapers that the Russians were going to build an anti-ballistic missile system around Tallinn. And uh, this is uh, Tallinn here, right there. And it was, uh, here's Russia, but they controlled Estonia and Latvia. And so they put this anti-ballistic missile site there. The missiles would come from the United States, they thought, over Tallinn. And they would try to shoot them down before they hit Moscow. And now, this fact that they were starting to do this stirred a lot of interest in the United States. Up till then, uh, we had been testing them, but we hadn't built any. It was too difficult to task. but. Uh, the fact that they were going to build one seemed to me a serious a problem in the arms race. Because if they uh, built a defense against our ballistic missiles, I knew that we would just build more ballistic missiles. It's so easy to destroy with an atomic bomb and so hard to protect that it was clear whoever wanted to destroy a city would be able to succeed. You could fire 50 missiles at Moscow. During the Cold War, we had 64 missiles trained on Moscow. And, and so there was uh, no limit to how many missiles you could build and target a city with. And uh, so the Russians were asking for trouble by building an anti-ballistic missile. And I wrote a paper and presented it at a Michigan arms control conference where there was a Russian uh, visitor. And it said, should the Soviet Union build an anti-ballistic missile system? And I said, no, this is going to just cause a lot of troubles. And part of the trouble was, not only would they induce us to build more missiles, but our Congress would say, if they have an anti-ballistic missile system, we should have one too. And then we would start building one, and both sides would be building these anti-ballistic missile systems. And nobody would be sure whether they, how well they would work. So you would redouble putting on extra margins of security with extra missiles, and then they would build more anti-ballistic missiles, and a whole new layer of arms race would appear, one that was completely necessary. Now, in those days, 
uh, everybody thought that anything that was technologically possible would uh, eventually be built. Uh, for example, the supersonic transport. Uh, people thought, well, if it's possible, it will be built. In the end, of course, it was not built. But in those days, in 62, uh, people laughed at me. They said, Jeremy, you know, if it can be built, it will, and so on. They didn't think an agreement could be reached between the United States and the Soviet Union not to build anything. No agreement of that kind had ever been reached. It seemed pretty far-fetched. Anyway, I presented this paper. Then I wrote a deeper paper, and I was asked to present this at a conference of very high-level Russians and uh, American strategists. They included Henry Kissinger, then a professor at Harvard. They included Jerome Wiesner, who was the science advisor to President Kennedy on the right. And the chairman of the group was Paul Doty, a biochemist. And they, they heard I had this paper. They said they'll give, give me $1,000 if I could, they could have the paper. That was a lot of money in those days. I said, I don't want the money. I want to present the paper. You've got to let me present the paper, and then I'll come. But I had the most important paper, so these very senior people had to accept my presence at this very high-level private meeting, which was a very rare kind of meeting. The Kennedy administration had given Doty a letter saying, so long as this doesn't become public, we'll support you. You know, but the idea that Russians and Americans were talking about the arms race privately, it was pretty sensitive in 62. So I went to this meeting in 64. We were encouraged by one of the Russians to learn uh, Russian. And uh, I said, oh, well, that's a great idea. I'll ask BJ to do it. So uh, BJ began learning Russian. And we went to Moscow five times each year uh, during our vacation to try to talk the Russians into this idea. Because the Russians had lost one person in 10 in World War II, and they, they told me, look, Jeremy, uh, we cannot tell Russians not to spend money on defenses. I mean, my God, defenses are good. Offenses are bad. We can't, can't go around telling people after they've been ravaged by World War II, all of the Soviet Union decimated, that they shouldn't spend money on defense. Uh, but later I heard they were saying in Russia, well, yeah, but we hear the capitalists will make a lot of money out of this. And that was their reason in Russia for trying to avoid getting into an arms race where the capitalists would profit. Now, in, uh, uh, in 69, the pressure grew on the Lyndon Johnson administration in McNamara to build an anti-ballistic missile system. Uh, the Republicans in Congress wanted to do it. And uh, so they didn't know what to do. And they didn't want to do it, but they, Lyndon Johnson said, we got to do something. So McNamara gave a very strange speech. A friend of mine in the Pentagon wrote it, uh, Morton Halperin. And uh, McNamara went to San Francisco, and he gave a speech saying, anti-ballistic missile systems are bad, 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 but we're going to build one against the Chinese. They had decided to try to get away with a small anti-ballistic missile system. The Chinese threat seemed smaller. They thought maybe we could shoot down Chinese missiles uh, rather completely, but even though we couldn't do it with Soviet missiles. So that's what they said. Now, this backfired in their face, and it backfired for a very strange reason. I was not then the president of the Federation of American Scientists. I became the president the next year. And this federation had the original atomic scientists in it, and they had defunct chapters all over the country. And so what happened was the, um, uh, what happened was the Army decided to try to build this anti-ballistic missile system around in 12 sites. They were going to build one around Seattle, one around Washington, one around Boston. They took the major cities. They were going to build an anti-ballistic missile system around each one. And, uh, the scientists of the Federation of American Scientists in these rather defunct chapters, but they still sort of existed, um, they told the public, you know, these anti-ballistic missiles that they're putting around our cities, they have nuclear warheads on them. And the public became alarmed. They said this started what was called the bombs in the backyard debate. The public said, look, uh, we're worried about atomic bombs being launched against us, but we certainly don't want atomic bombs surrounding our city. What if they went off? They would blow up our city. So this debate raged in the various boondocks. One of them was in Boston. 
And in Boston, the scientists there all denounced the anti-ballistic missile system. They agreed with me that it wouldn't work. And uh, the public was alarmed with the nuclear warheads around the city. And so Senator Kennedy was the senator. Senator Edward Kennedy was senator from Massachusetts. And uh, he decided to oppose the anti-ballistic missile system. Now, Senator Kennedy was a very powerful senator. And when he began to oppose it, the votes in the Senate jumped from five senators against this to 34. And, but that still wasn't a majority. And the, uh, the, it wasn't just the Republicans who wanted to build this. Every uh, large industries would all have a piece of this. It was going to be built in parts in every state. It had tremendous economic pressure behind it. And that was one of the reasons a lot of senators were supporting it. And um, so uh, when they saw that uh, people wouldn't vote for an anti-Chinese defense, they decided to say that uh, we needed a defense to defend our missiles. Our land-based missiles might be attacked by the Russians. This was a completely phony argument because we had missiles on submarines that could not be attacked and there were more than enough warheads on them to retaliate against Russia and destroy all their cities many times over. Uh, but uh, Melvin Laird, the Secretary of Defense, uh, said, uh, started talking about a first strike threat. His mother actually called him and said, Melvin, you're frightening people, <laughs> which he was. Uh, and then uh, a very brilliant scientist, Panofsky at Stanford, testified as to why this anti-ballistic missile system wouldn't work for defending the land-based missiles. And so then people shifted the rationale again, and it had gone from anti-Soviet system to an anti-Chinese system to defending our missiles. And then a new rationale came up. Well, we, we need a test site. You know, we've got to build one, at least have a test site. And, uh, and the votes continued to go against it. And finally, there were 50 votes against it. And at this, the administration said, OK, well, look, vote for this, for God's sakes, and if you do, we will uh, negotiate a treaty with the Russians to stop anti-ballistic missile systems on both sides. But if you don't vote for it, then we won't have one. And then they might build one. And then they'd have one and we wouldn't. So you better vote for this. So tremendous pressure was put on senators to vote for it. And it finally got a 50-50 vote. Now, the Nixon administration was uh, in office. And so the vice president of the Nixon administration had the tie casting vote in the Senate. And so it was approved on a tie vote. This was actually perfect from uh, the point of view of getting the treaty. Because, of course, if they had a, not approved it, there would be no treaty because we wouldn't have one and the Russians could build one. And if they uh, had approved it, we would have built one. Then there would have been no treaty. So 50-50 was perfect. Uh, so um, then in 72... Uh, Nixon signed the treaty. We were very fortunate that the Republicans were in charge in, the, in this period because it was easier for them to negotiate a treaty than it would have been for the Democrats. And so they corralled enough Republican senators as well as Democratic senators. And Nixon and Brezhnev here signed the treaty in 1972. So um, everything was calm for 11 years. And then in 1983, and, and, and a test site was built in Vandenberg Air Force Base, not far from us. Uh, uh, the treaty said each side can have one site. The Russians said, okay, we're going to use one around Moscow. And we said, okay, we're going to put one around in Vandenberg. And we used this Vandenberg test site to try to shoot down missiles as in tests. The missiles are fired from the South Pacific, from Inuitok, and, uh, and then uh, they tell Vandenberg, you know, this test missile is going in this direction, in this place, and Vandenberg tries to shoot it down. Fifty years have passed and uh, since this whole debate began in 62, and they're still not really able to do it successfully. But a lot of money has been spent on it. Now, when Reagan came in, in 1983, he proposed a Star Wars defense. Uh, he was encouraged by Edward Teller, and uh, he thought it might really work. He didn't consult the Secretary of Defense or the Secretary of State. They went forward very quietly, announced this, uh, they were going to do this. And uh, Reagan had great ability to sell things, and people had a lot of confidence in him. And he said, I think we can build a defense that would be like an astrodome, you know, defend against everything. You know, like putting a ceiling over the United States, you know. Uh, 
the scientists thought this was crazy. The American Physics Society and the National Academy of Sciences, they all said this is impossible. It would take us 10 years to figure out whether this could ever be possible, but we certainly don't think it's possible now. But anyway, this caused a lot of trouble. The Russians had great faith in our ability to do things, and they had more faith than our scientists did. And they thought, if Reagan's going to try to do this and the Americans try, they can probably do it. So they became very frightened because they thought, well, if the Americans do it, then we won't have a deterrent and uh, they could blow us up with their missiles and we wouldn't be able to respond with ours because they would have this Astrodome defense. So they got very nervous. And I thought my anti-ballistic missile treaty would go down the drain. I invented a solution which I called the bear hug strategy. I sold it to the Russians and I sold it to the State Department. I told the Russians, look, why don't you tell the Reagan administration that you'll throw away half your missiles if we'll throw, if the Americans will throw away half their missiles and it'd be a lot better to throw away the missiles in peacetime than to try to defend against them in wartime and let's set off a disarmament race and get rid of these missiles in a peaceful and stable way. And uh, Gorbachev bought this idea and uh, he proposed to cut uh, missiles by 50% for starters. And then uh, I told the State Department, uh, why don't you tell the Congress that you're threatening the Russians with an anti-ballistic missile system in order to get them to do disarmament and you're forcing them into this disarmament without spending a penny. It'll be great for you. And Paul Nitza, who was a hawk in the State Department, thought this was a great idea. The Secretary of State thought it was a great idea. The National Security Advisor thought it was a great idea. Uh, but they knew it was difficult to get ideas past uh, President Reagan. But they knew that if they didn't make a lot of, out of it, that he might just shrug and nod and say, OK. So the three of them ganged up on Reagan and they said, look, uh, here's a piece of paper. When you see Gorbachev at, uh, in Geneva, you're going to have your first summit meeting. Here's the paper we've approved that you should hand to him. And uh, Reagan said, OK, sure, and signed off on that. So this paper was handed to Gorbachev. Uh, and it had, uh, it, it had my ideas in it. The Rand Corporation, by this time, I later learned, was also proposing a similar thing. And, uh, and the National Security Advisor thought this was a great sting because he thought, we're never going to be able to build this thing, but if the Russians are frightened, let's get them to do disarmament. So it wasn't agreed at uh, Geneva, but uh, Reagan and uh, Gorbachev had a good session and they decided to meet again and negotiations continued. And after a while, uh, this, uh, this idea uh, was uh, finally accepted. Uh, Gorbachev uh, basically told the Reagan administration, look, we don't have to agree on this. I'm just telling you, if you violate the anti-ballistic missile system, I'm out of the disarmament game. We'll go back to building missiles. Now in 98, there was a new ABM crisis. North Korea was firing missiles. They were getting longer and longer. Finally, they became Tapadong 2 they could reach with a very light warhead to Alaska. People became alarmed about this. The North Koreans are very poor. It was difficult for them to build anything and uh, they haven't been doing much of it lately and the scares pretty well uh, declined. But it was a problem at the time. It created a new rationale for an anti-ballistic missile system. And um, then the Bush administration came in in, their, uh, in 2001 and they decided to scuttle the ABM treaty. Well, uh, I thought this was a bad idea and I wanted to keep the treaty going, but I didn't quite know what to do. I ran into this man, Stanley Rivelis. Now, Rivelis was a real expert on the ABM treaty because he was on the commission, the US Soviet commission, that dealt with the finer points of the treaty. You know, were they complying? Were we complying? Were there any problems, any exceptions? So he knew a lot about it. He'd been following it very closely. He was a friend of mine. And uh, he said, you know, Jeremy, one thing that might make sense is to propose to the Russians what Reagan proposed at Reykjavik. Reagan had said at Reykjavik to Gorbachev, I know you're concerned that we're going to tear up the ABM treaty. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'll agree not to tear up the ABM treaty for five years. If you will agree to let me do the tests, that are prohibited in the ABM Treaty. 
which meant I won't deploy it, I won't build it, but I'll be allowed to test. If you'll let me do testing violations, I won't rip up the treaty. And this was proposed because it was understood that we were not within five years of deploying a treaty, uh, an ABM system. So we could easily say, if you just let us test, fine, we won't deploy the darn thing. So this had been proposed by Reagan, although it was accepted in the end at Reykjavik. So Rivalis reminded me of this. So I thought, this is a very good idea. I remembered something else. Uh, I remembered that not only Reagan had this point of view, but so did Andrei Sakharov. Now, Andrei Sakharov was the Russian physicist that invented the Russian hydrogen bomb. He was the counterpart of Edward Teller. And he uh, became a dissident, campaigning for human rights, complaining about how different scientists were treated, complaining there wasn't enough human rights. And they couldn't do anything to him because he had received all these medals of the Soviet Union for his achievement in building their hydrogen bomb. He was a great hero there. And uh, finally, when they invaded Afghanistan, he protested and the Politburo said, enough. We cannot afford to have our most famous scientists bitching and complaining about our actions. Put them in exile in Gorky. So he was put in exile in Gorky, and I communicated with him secretly during that time. I sent him a computer so that he'd have something to do with his mind, a little HP computer that you could program with 600 steps. And they sent me presents and mementos, which were smuggled through the U.S. Embassy. And, uh, <coughs> um, but in 1967, he was released by Gorbachev. Gorbachev had come in, let him out of Gorky. I had told the Russians, if you don't like the ABM treaty, let, 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 him out, let Sakharov out of Gorky. He hates the ABM system, and he's your strongest voice against it. And I think this is one of the reasons they let him out. So he uh, came to Moscow, and I spent an evening with him in Moscow uh, on the occasion of a conference. And we were both presenting papers at the conference, and I told him what I was going to say, which was, what I called the Reagan-Sakharov plan. And the reason I called it that is because, well, I didn't call it that at that time, but uh, what had happened at that time, is I told him my approach to this problem, and he, he said, I agree. He said, but, it's a good idea. He said, but the tests don't really matter. If the Americans actually deploy an anti-ballistic missile, then we should stop the disarmament, but we don't need to stop the disarmament just because they make some test. That was his idea. I thought my idea was better because, uh, for political reasons, but on strategic grounds, he was, his reasoning was good. And uh, he was happy that I was supporting him. His wife even thanked me for this, that we were on the same track, and he presented his ideas at this conference. So I remembered when Rivalis told me that Reagan liked the idea of ignoring the test, I remembered that Sakharov had liked the idea of ignoring the test. And so I, I made a button. Whenever I was lobbying for something, I would make a big button and reduce whatever I was doing to a slogan. And I called it the Reagan-Sakharov plan because both of them had said, we don't have to worry about the test. And I called it Mothball the ABM Treaty. I put a big moth on it. And I decided to start the lobbying both sides into the Reagan-Sakharov plan. And I thought this is a pretty good uh, uh, slogan because Reagan was a great name in America great conservative, and Sakharov was a great hero in the Soviet Union, and a Reagan-Sakharov plan should appeal to everybody. That was my idea. So then in Washington, uh, now in Washington in June, I took the Russian ambassador to lunch. I had met him at a disarmament conference a month before, and I said, look, I want to go to Moscow and talk to some high-placed people. Would you help me make appointments? And he agreed. I showed him my button told him what I wanted to do, and uh, he said he'd make appointments with high officials, I could make the others. And then I talked to three middle-level State Department officials who were friends of mine. One of them had actually worked for me at the Federation of American Scientists, Lucas Fisher, Jim Timby, Steve Rosencrantz. They all thought this was a good idea, and they were experts, but of course they were middle-level officials. They didn't have much influence in Washington, but I was encouraged. So then I went to the White House, and I talked to this man, Stephen Hadley. Now, Stephen Hadley was the Deputy National Security Advisor. 
And one reason I was able to get an appointment with him was because I had sort of saved his career. I want to tell you how I had saved his career. I was on a panel with about a dozen famous people, experts anyway, and he was the chairman. And Robert McNamara was on the panel. And he was against the anti-ballistic missile. And the panel was supposed to study this whole problem. And Robert McNamara got annoyed that they weren't saying enough in this uh, booklet they were preparing against the anti-ballistic missile. And he said, listen, if you don't say the following thing in this pamphlet, I'm out, I quit. He was tough. He was a former Secretary of Defense. He didn't fool around. And it was, you know, so this man at this point turned white uh, because he knew that uh, he wanted to be a high official in the Nixon administration. And uh, if this pamphlet came out with him as the chairman supporting, uh, saying favorable things about the anti-ballistic missile system, he thought he wouldn't get a job as a Vulcan key advisor to. So I said, uh, Bob, I said to Secretary McNamara, I said, Bob, would you agree if it's, it would be enough if the following were said? And I put out a compromise statement. And McNamara, with very quick intelligence, immediately said, yeah, that would be okay with me. And Steve said, that's okay. So that was put in, and the situation was saved. So uh, he considered me an honest opponent of the anti-ballistic uh, uh, anti missile systems. And so he was happy to give me an appointment. It was August. Things were slow in Washington. Uh, so I had 45 minutes with him, which would not have happened. I think, during a busy season. So we had a good discussion about this idea. First, he made some objections, and then I explained why I could answer them. And then finally, he said, look, Jeremy, the problem with your proposal is it's too good. He said, we want to tear up the anti-ballistic missile treaty. We think we've won the debate over this. If we just mothballed it, as you suggest, some other administration might come in and then they might continue the treaty and we don't want that. And the reason your proposal is too good is because you're absolutely right. It doesn't require us to do anything that we weren't going to do anyway because we can't do anything but test during the next five years. So uh, he said uh, people will gang up on us and tell us we ought to do this and uh, you know, so we don't want this. So, so he said, look, uh, please don't tell the Russians that we're for this. We're against it. We wouldn't support it. So I said, okay, Steve, no problem. I'm not even going to tell him I talked to you, but uh, I wouldn't tell him anything that wasn't true. And he knew that. So I went home, and I thought about this, what to do. I decided Steve was number three in the uh, White House. Um, well, he, he was working for Condoleezza Rice. You know, she later became Secretary of State, but she was the National Security Advisor then, and she was working for President Bush. So I thought Steve says they'll definitely be against it, but who knows? If the Russians propose it, uh, maybe uh, President Bush will have a different idea. Who knows? Steve hadn't had time to consult with anybody. I just dropped in on him, told it to him, and he rejected it. So I went home, and, uh, well, and the next, uh, uh, so I... Uh, I went to the Foreign Relations Committee. Senator Biden, that's him, now the Vice President, he was the chairman of the committee. He was friendly to my way of thinking, and so was his staff. I knew the staff well. I talked to Ed Levine on arms control and Brian McKeon on legal issues. They're now working for Biden in the White House. And uh, they said they thought this was very sensible, and they didn't see any insurmountable obstacles. So that was encouraging to me. And then the next day, the White House changed its mind in a very unusual way. Here's the lineup. There's Steve Hadley, there's Condoleezza Rice, and there's George Bush. And uh, so I got this call at home from uh, Steve Hadley, and he says, uh, Jeremy, I, I talked over your idea with Condoleezza Rice, and she said, oh, Jeremy's trying to put us in a box, meaning corner us with his idea. I said, oh, Steve, you know, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just doing my job. And uh, he, he said, oh, well, don't worry. She was laughing at the time. And, uh, but anyway, I want you to know, he said, that uh, we probably would not accept this. So I put down the phone, and I thought to myself, now, this is very interesting. Steve Hadley is a lawyer, a skilled lawyer. He's gone from telling me we won't do it to we probably won't do it. 
Now you have to understand what probably means to someone like me. I spent my whole life working on impossible dreams where people told me this will never happen. When, if somebody said to me this probably won't happen, for me that was an open door. I thought, boy, that's an easy one compared to my usual thing. And so I thought probably, wow. It took me a while to fully realize that he had been told by a kind of Lester Rice to walk this thing back. Don't turn it off immediately. Who knows what George Bush might do? We don't, can't speak for him if the Russians propose it. It's not such a terrible idea, you know? So he had been told to walk it back and he had done it so subtly it took me quite a while to figure out exactly what was going on. Anyway, I decided to go ahead. I went to Russia. I stayed in this hotel, the Arbat Hotel. It used to be where the Central Committee would uh, meet uh, under the Soviet Union, but you understand by now there was no Soviet Union. Russia had become a capitalist state and uh, the Communist Party was no longer running it and Putin was in charge and uh, so the Central Committee wasn't using this and I was living there. It was right behind the Foreign Ministry so I could walk to the Foreign Ministry. You could walk to the Defense Ministry and you could walk to another institute which I often went to, the Arbatov Institute. So I had dinner first off with this man, Andrei Kokoshin. Now Kokoshin was a former deputy defense minister, but I had known him when he was quite junior and he had been on a delegation I'd hosted in Key West, so we were very friendly. I gave him a map, an ancient map of the Kremlin, and uh, you remember the Russians had given us a, a wooden eagle to put in our ambassador's office and he had put it up in his office, but it turned out it had listening devices in it. And the Russians had given this wooden eagle to us, uh, like a Trojan horse eagle, which had in it these uh, things. So I said to Kokoshin, I, here's this map, it was a paper map of the Kremlin, you can put it in your office. Don't worry, Andre, it doesn't have listening devices in it. <laughs> and he said, don't worry, Jeremy, in my office, I'm very careful, I never speak. Anyway, that was the joke, but the positive thing was he thought this idea was not so bad. And at that time, he was playing a key role uh, going back and forth between the Kremlin and uh, the White House on arms control. And later, he became the national security advisor in, the, uh, in Russia, so that was good to get his vote. And then I went to see the deputy foreign minister, Georgi Mamedov. That's him with BJ and me, and that's him carrying my book. Now, uh, Mamedov was uh, the deputy foreign minister. They had a foreign minister and seven deputies, one for Asia, one for Europe. He was the one for arms control. So he was the key negotiator. And he was negotiating with this man, John Bolton. Bolton was the undersecretary of state in the State Department. Bolton was very smart. He graduated summa from Yale and a very productive person, but a very extremely hawkish person. And he was against any agreements with the Soviet Union. He was in that school of thought, which was prevalent in the Reagan administration which was that arms control uh, would help support them and uh, uh, we, if we don't agree with them, it'll help undermine them and we would rather undermine them than support them. So he had been against virtually all the arms control treaties during the Soviet Union period and continued that way. So he was hard for Mamedov to deal with. Anyway, I gave my idea to Mamedov. Now Mamedov had been in, Ma in Washington uh, when he was a young man in the 70s when I was first became president of the Federation of American Scientists. And so he knew who I was from when he had been a young staffer in the Russian embassy. And he, I had visited him a number of times when he was high official. And he had once said to me, Jeremy, you know, you've changed our policy in Russia on things a number of times and we don't know how you do it because we can't change the policy ourselves. Which sort of meant from the outside you had a little more leverage. Anyway, so he was a fan. And he liked my idea. He said, you know, I'm going to see uh, Bolton in two days in New York, and I like this idea. I'll try it again on him. I was doing something a little bit like this, but uh, I said, you got to go public with this. He said, well, we don't really want to go public. They were sort of drifting, drifting. They weren't sure what to do. Uh, but he liked the idea. Now, the day I met with him was, guess what day? It was 9-11. It was the day the terrorists struck in New York. I met with him at 11 o'clock, but that was 11 o'clock Moscow time. The terrorists struck at 5 p.m. Moscow time, 9 o'clock our time. Russia's eight hours ahead of us. 
So I didn't know anything, the world had changed when I talked to my Madoff, and neither did he. But by five o'clock, when I went to dinner with this man, who was chairman of an arms control committee of scientists, we could see on the television the uh, bombing of the World Trade Center. So I talked to uh, Asipyan, who was a famous scientist in Russia and chairman of their arms control committee, uh, the arms control committee that used to meet with our arms control committee from our National Academy of Sciences. These two academies of sciences were working together on arms control. <coughs> and he told me the MacArthur Foundation doesn't seem to be funding our exchanges anymore. We're not sure what's going to happen. And you're, the committee you've got in the National Academy, they're all against the anti-ballistic missile, but Bush is for it, so we're not sure, uh, you know, how much influence they've got. And he didn't seem to have much influence, but... Uh, so I didn't think he would help me much, but then I went to see two people that could. This one, Velikov, was the most respected scientist in Russia, the head of the Atomic Energy Institute, the Kurchatov Institute, uh, often a candidate to be president of the National Academy of Sciences. And he was the only scientist that we could find over decades in Russia that could say yes to us during the Soviet Union period. Most of them would say, I'll talk to somebody. Everybody was afraid to say okay. But he was influential enough and shrewd enough that he would say, well, I'll try. And he would try and he would go to the Politburo and he had a lot of standing with them. And he was a good friend of mine. When my book uh, that some of you have a copy of was translated into Russian, he wrote the introduction. And so when I went to see him, told him the idea, he thought it was a good one. And he could take it to Putin. I mean, he had very high standing in Russia. So that was good. And then I met with this man, Stepashin. Now, Stepashin was then the head of the auditing agency in Russia. But when I met him, and BJ and I met with him, he was prime minister. And we had sold him an idea so important that the next week he had been in the White House with Clinton proposing this idea to Clinton. I'll give a talk on this later, but it was the most far-reaching disarmament plan that uh, the Soviets had ever proposed. So as far as I was concerned, he was a great guy, and as far as he was concerned, I was a great guy because I gave him this idea. He had been planning to see Clinton the next week, and he said to me, this is a great idea. You've told me what I'm going to tell Clinton. He said, uh, what can I do for you? I said, would you wear my badge, my button? I, want a picture. I, I said, I want a picture with you. He said, yeah, and I'll wear your button. And this is for the Washington Post, he said. So I had this picture with the prime minister wearing my button. I went back to the State Department and I said, listen, I know you guys don't take me too seriously, but here's the prime minister. He's coming on Friday. He's wearing my button. I think you better study my proposal. They went wild. I'll talk to you more about that in a later talk. Uh, and then I went to see Major General Vladimir Dvorkin. Now, Dvorkin... Uh, used to be head of their rocket institute where they made calculations about missiles and which missiles could attack and which not. And he once said to me, Jeremy, you know, when I talk to you about these things, I feel we're on the same wavelength. But he said, the big boys, they don't agree with us. By which he meant the high generals that he had to deal with. He was just a major general, the four-star generals and the marshals. They would go around saying, ah, the Americans, they'll never attack. Forget it, Dvorkin, don't worry about it. So they weren't taking the McNamara stone approach to calculations of deterrence, you know, they just thought, the heck with it. So, but anyway, Dvorkin was then working for a very important person named Sergeyev, and Sergeyev had been a five-star general, a marshal of the Soviet Union, and a secretary of defense, a minister of defense. He said, I'll take your idea to Sergeyev. So I thought, that's good. And he considered me a legendary character. Once he'd been in my basement in uh, Washington uh, when we were running a, hosting some Russians, and I showed him this letter which had been sent by my boss to Robert McNamara in 1963. And this letter from my boss said, we've got this guy Stone here. He thinks neither side should build an anti-ballistic missile system. You better show this to McNamara because he's going to tell this idea to some Russians at a conference <laughs> and maybe the Secretary of Defense would like to comment on it. So this letter was so early in this debate, you know, that this was one of the reasons Dvorkin thought I was a legendary character, you know. Even Andrei Sakharov, who was against anti-ballistic missile systems, once said to me, when did you start, uh, you know, thinking about this? I said, 63. He said, oh, wow. He had started getting this approach in 67. 
after I'd been to Russia and started seeding the idea around. Anyway, then I went to see Sergei Rogov. He ran a USA, an institute on Russian-American relations. He was very well informed. He used to go to the White House once a year, talk to a lot of high-placed people, and uh, told him my idea. And Sergei said, you know, Jeremy, this idea would pass if the, if the Republicans will propose it. So he was a very shrewd person, and he was right about that. Um, then I went to see General Balowski. Now, General Balowski, you see, is a four-star general. He was at that time number two man in the whole Russian military. Later, he became number one, and now he's a national security advisor in the Putin White House. So anyway, he's a very high official. And he was very happy to see me because I had run two seminars in my basement in Washington, and he had been in my basement twice. The first time, I had about 15 arms control experts come to talk to him about arms control. I spent a lot of my life trying to uh, indoctrinate the Russian officials in American ideas about arms control, you know. And uh, in the first meeting, that's him, Balowski, talking to this attractive blonde woman, Rose Gottemuller. Rose Gottemuller right now is our highest official in the State Department for negotiations on arms control with uh, Russia. She was in charge of the Obama negotiations, and uh, she spoke Russian, so he spent a lot of time talking to her. There may have been other reasons. And uh, uh, so she met him there. So that was my first seminar. And the second one, I invited Robert McNamara to come. He was retired, of course. And I invited another retired Secretary of Defense, um, uh, the senator from Maine, uh, Bill uh, Um, Cohen, Bill Cohen. And uh, McNamara started, uh, McNamara always came to meetings prepared to make a point. So he started telling Balowski, now look, number one, number two, number three, number four, number five, and waving his finger at him. I said, Balowski, now you know how Prime Minister Kosygin felt when uh, Lyndon Johnson met with the Prime Minister in Glassboro and Johnson said, McNamara, tell the Prime Minister why they shouldn't build an ABM. And he had waved his finger at Kosygin and lectured him. Balowski and everybody else laughed. McNamara said, I thought you were my friend, Jeremy. So uh, anyway, so I'm meeting with Balowski and a three-star general, Yesen. Yesen is, Balowski's in the middle, Yesen's on his right. Yesen was retired, but he had been head of Russian strategic forces. So, and he knew me and liked me, and, uh, and there I am in the middle, and uh, so we're having this discussion. I'm trying to talk Balowski into permitting these tests. Balowski said, no, we can't do that. It would affect my self-esteem. That was an ar argument I'd never heard before in arms control. And uh, I said, now, uh, uh, I said, look, when I came here 35 years ago and first proposed this treaty, all you Russians told me this is crazy, crazy, crazy. This is a defensive system. Every penny should be spent on defense. Why don't you do something about offensive systems, you know? Now you're telling me it's holy writ and not a single word can be changed or it'll affect your self-esteem. This is crazy. So he continued in that vein. I said, uh, look, uh, you're a general, right? Uh, sometimes you have to sacrifice a battalion to keep the army going, right? He said, right. So I said, well, that's, this is such a case. You're going to lose the whole treaty if you don't permit some small changes in it, and you could keep it going for five years, and then maybe the Democrats would be in charge and the treaty would be maintained. He said, no, we can't do this. He said, we know this is your creation, and you just want to keep your creation going. Well, I was happy for the praise, but I unhappy about the conclusion. He said, the Bush administration just wants to uh, uh, build an ABM because they want to get out of the treaty because they need arms expenditures to keep the American economy going. This was a Marxist view that America made money out of arms expenditures and needed them to keep the economy going. So it was pretty hopeless talking to him. And finally, I said, you know, uh, look, you got a problem here because we got so many missiles that we can attack most of your missiles, but not all. And uh, if, uh, we had an, if we get out of the treaty and we build an anti-ballistic missile system and we attack most of your missiles, the few that are left when they fire at us, maybe we'll shoot them all down. So then where would you be? You wouldn't have a deterrent. You really want to get into this. 
And to my astonishment, he said, Jeremy, we're here to talk about the anti-ballistic missile. Why are you talking about offensive missiles? So I thought, you know, for people like me and McNamara and everybody in the Pentagon, this was zany because from our point of view, this was all mixed up together, the missiles and the anti-missiles, and you couldn't talk about one without the other. So I realized that I had lost the debate with him. Now at this point, Kennedy Airport was closed, and on the last day of my visa, because of the terrorist attack, and but BJ saved me, I would be still trapped in Russia if my visa had run out, but she found a flight on the last day that would get me to Friendship, uh, would get me to the Baltimore Airport. So I got out of Russia. And uh, so this was September, and then in October, I thought I was making progress. The New York Times said, Bush advisors say the Russians are warming to tests. Several administration officials are saying that Russia might accept the tests, and they were working on that assumption. So I thought, wow, that is good news. And, uh, but I wasn't sure what was happening. And then Putin was coming to Washington on his way to the ranch to talk to Bush in Texas at the ranch. So I was invited to the embassy. That's the new Russian embassy. And a lot of famous people were there. Carl Levin, the chairman of the Armed Services Committee, who was a classmate of mine in BJ's. And a lot of famous people, high officials, all wanted to meet Putin. And before everybody was seated, Putin hadn't come in yet. And I saw Mamadov, Madoff, who had come with Putin, up on the platform. So I dared to get out of the audience, walked up to the platform. I said, Mamadov, what's happened to my idea? Has it been accepted or not? I was desperate to hear this or I would never have dared to break protocol and go up onto this platform. And he said, Jeremy, it's a good idea. It's bought us time, uh, but the Americans haven't agreed to it yet. And what we're, maybe they will when we go to uh, the ranch in Texas tomorrow. So I thought, well, that sounds pretty good. And then I learned later uh, that that very night or the next day, Condoleezza Rice actually made my proposal. The White House had gone from no to probably not to actually proposing it. She proposed it in a very masculine way. I should have done it that way myself. She was smarter than I was. You know, she proposed it as a kind of an ultimatum. She said, if you don't let us test, we're going to drop out of the treaty. In other words, she didn't say, we're begging you to let us test so we can keep the treaty. She said, if you don't do this, we'll be out of the treaty. I should have put it that way myself. It's the same thing exactly, but I, she was more forceful than I was. And what I learned later was that Ivanov, the foreign minister, had said, well, yeah, we agree in principle, but we want droit de regard. Now, I don't know how many of you speak French and know what droit de regard means, but droit means right and regard means see. So droit de regard means we want the right to see each test before we agree to it. In other words, you tell us about the test, then we'll agree to it. Then you tell us about the next test, then we'll agree to that. You know. So when this was reported to Secretary Rumsfeld, whom, as you know, was a no-nonsense person, he said, show the Russians every test, beg them to agree to it. We're not going to do that. So this whole idea went down in flames. And the next day, Putin and Bush went to the ranch, met at the ranch, and the uh, treaty disappeared. Now, I have later learned what actually happened. Uh, Bush, said to, uh, Bush said to Putin, this is not against you. This is not against you. Uh, we may need it for North Korea. We may need it for Iran. You know, we're not going to try to build a big anti ballistic missile against, uh, against you. And Putin said later something very stunning, which I learned a lot from. He said, if Bush is going to treat me as a friend, many issues such as ABM and NATO can be dealt with. This was very interesting to me. Yeah, and you have to understand that Russia was a very different Russia. It was not only a capitalist Russia by the time Putin said this, but it was completely under control of Putin. In an earlier stage, the Duma would have been complaining and screaming about various points. But by this time, Putin had the Duma under control and every other part of Russia under control. And he really ran the place by himself. So he, he thought, well, if I'm on friendly relations with Bush, that's more important than these other things. And I can overlook them and nobody will complain. So it was a whole different world. And later, I went to Russia on a later trip to talk about Iran, uh, 
And I got up to a high level at the National Security Council, and I talked to a man, and he said, I can't remember what the cause of his saying it was, but it really struck me. He said, you know, if we hadn't had this friendly, uh, good chemistry between Bush and Putin, I don't know what we would have done. Now, that was a stunning thing to me. I didn't think the Russians felt quite so desperate. But when Bush looked at Putin and said, I've looked at his soul and he's an okay guy, an amazing statement to say about a KGB operative who installed KGB operatives all over Russia when he got in. Uh, if a Democrat had said that, they would have thrown him out of office, impeached him for it, you know. And he, uh, so when Bush said that and made friends with Putin, it made a lot of things possible. So I, I have to say, I was not a fan of President, this President Bush, but uh, this personal diplomacy with Putin was effective. Now, okay, what's the moral here? You know, on the front of the book that many of you have, I have a butterfly because the theory I've been working on all my life is that a butterfly flapping his wings in Paris could cause a storm in New York under the right meteorological circumstances but it's rare circumstances. This was a really rare circumstance. It, it was so rare that, um, well, first of all, you know, the, the treaty lasted for 30 years, and during that time it saved an immense amount of money, an immense amount of instability. You know, it just eliminated another layer of arms race. So it was, a, it was again, the most effective treaty in the history of the Cold War. But look how close it came to not starting. First of all, if McNamara and Johnson hadn't pushed it to the Russians at Glassboro, if I hadn't started talking about it in 62, a whole head of steam was required. It took 10 years to negotiate it. And during that time, the uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson administration tried to build one against the Chinese, which was only defeated because defunct chapters rose up and said, this will put bombs in the backyard. And that brought Senator Kennedy into it. And then finally, 50 senators were against it. So then we had a perfect tie vote, which was perfect for forcing the negotiation of the treaty. So the existence of this treaty uh, was balanced on the head of a pin. And if we hadn't had Nixon and Kissinger in charge at the time, they wouldn't have negotiated it. You know, wouldn't have been able to, I mean, Democrats would not have been able to get the treaty approved. But fortunately, we had Republicans in charge then. So this, a whole lot of things happened to make this possible. And so uh, that is the, um, uh, that's, a, that, that's the moral. This treaty was an enormous political accident, really. It come at a time, started at a time when the idea of an agreement of this kind with the Russians was absolutely pie in the sky, and which materialized uh, later and was kept in business despite President Reagan's ideas, barely. And uh, so it was a really big thing and a really rare thing. And I'm happy to have had the opportunity to tell you about it. Thanks for coming.